Now, you, you've gotten really to the, the basics. And again, it goes back to this horrible problem of misunderstandings. We, we do not get source material that, that educates the public the basic problems. <clears throat> Just look at the three letters, CIA. C is central. It's not covert. It's not clandestine. It's central. And that word comes from the law. Intelligence. Intelligence is clearly a word that can be looked up in a dictionary without any problem. It tells what it is. The last one is A, agency. An agency, by definition, is an organization that works for someone. In other words, it's not its own business. It can't do anything until it's told to do something. And in this country, with our form of government, that begins with Congress and the President. But in everyday activity, the CIA comes under the National Security Council and if, if, such a, if such and such a plan that they want to do something about had not been directed, not just approved, but directed by the National Security Council, they're not allowed to do it. I've had the deputy call me, the deputy of Central Intelligence, General Cabell, call me and say, Prouty, we need some helicopters in the Saigon area. Will you transfer that squadron from Udon down to Saigon? I said, General, I'll do that, but I have to have it. I have to have the, the word that that has been directed by the NSC. And I found out it wasn't, so I didn't move them. I mean, we had the authority to do to not do it if it hadn't been approved. I went to the Secretary of Defense, I told him about it, and he said, oh, he said, I think that was an oversight. I'll go back tomorrow's meeting and we'll take care of it. Sure enough, the next day, the Secretary of Defense, Mr. Gates, introduced the idea of putting the helicopters in Saigon, which, by the way, was against the Treaty of Geneva in 1954, but they decided to do it anyway. With that approval, I moved a whole squadron of <clears throat> Marine helicopters to Saigon, and that was the beginning of helicopters in Vietnam. Well, it just shows you how we apply this business of who's running the CIA and all this fiction about everybody else running it. It's run by the National Security Council, and of course their money and everything comes from Congress, so that's the oversight. What are they supposed to be doing? Intelligence. When the law was passed in 1947 <clears throat> that created the CIA, the only legal words about its business were to coordinate the intelligence of the United States government. And that's what their job is. And central, meaning that they were the central authority for this and not part of, say, the Navy or the State Department or so on. You put those together and you answer your question right away. Who runs the CIA or who should be running the CIA? It should be run in accordance with that law. The trouble is, as I told you, like when I went to brief congressmen myself, they wouldn't listen, they didn't seem to care, they didn't understand it, they didn't want to hear about it, and that applies to a lot of other parts of the government. But somebody needs to apply the law as it was written. And then newspapers and all that need to realize that agency, the CIA is an agency, that they're run by a man who's been given the job to do it, and they do it the way that their authorization stated it. And Mr. Dulles many, many times made it perfectly clear to people that he was a lawyer and that his business as the director of central intelligence was that of a lawyer for the U.S. government. In other words, operating for a, a sponsor. And those are important things to know because those are basic to everything CIA does and what our government does. And if we don't have the knowledge and the courage and the good sense to do it that way, then we do have a mess. But that's like taking your kids out to a playground. You don't watch them a little while, you don't know what the heck they're up to. You gotta keep things under control. And that's the role of the CIA in a nutshell. And I worked with them for nine years in the Pentagon. I worked with them years longer than that in other jobs. And I know exactly how it should be applied. But the trouble is, gradually through one device or another, and the pressure of money in a lot of cases, uh, they've broadened the scope of this thing so that we get uh, really terrible operations that they should never have been in. But it, it could be applied if, they, if, if somebody would take care of it. If, if, our own, if the people of this country would demand it, it could be straightened down. And when we go to the military and say, well, is it the military that's causing this? Are the military running away with this? The same applies. Military, by definition, by tradition, by the traditions of humankind, are go back to having leaders. If they aren't in a dictatorship. Well, fortunately, right at the moment, I don't think we've got a dictatorship. We might be close to it, but we don't have one. We've got a government who can control the military, 
provided, again, that the National Security Council controls them. And, and the effective way for Congress to do that is with money. If they don't want the military doing things, they just don't give them the money for it. And to think that the military is doing things, you know, anything it wants, is simply a, a, a recognition of the fact that they're being permitted to do anything they want. They can be stopped from doing it if the president says so. After all, he's the commander in chief. But what president, other than Kennedy with his 263, which he was going to take up, the, the document we've talked about, has ever come out and said, I'm going to bring the military back from Vietnam. We're not going to do that. Eisenhower came close to that once or twice, and, and uh, we, we did that. But uh, you see what I mean? These are not renegade agencies. They're under control. But the control has to be applied. It's like driving a team of horses. If you don't pull on the reins, they'll just go anywhere they want. That's fundamental. I think that... Um I guess, in, in a way, what I'm asking is... Uh Once we understand the problem, once we take time to, to sort through the, the articles and, and paperwork and figure out what's really going on with our society with regards to the military and these black budgets, um, uh, you know, in what direction should, should we go with that information? You know, because it seems like anybody who does run, uh, the politics is... Uh, uh, such a backward game now that the good people aren't deciding to run. The people who really could make an effort, right? And maybe the last guy who had anything to offer was uh, Perot, and he seemed to bungle the thing, and now I, I don't see anybody else really um, coming forward to, to have enough will and, and personality to stand up and say, this is an unpopular decision, but I'm going to do this, you know, like Kennedy. It's unpopular, but I'm going to have to shut down some of the military budget. So, you know, and the thing is, the way the, the thing is so covert, and the way they are, spy on everybody, they would they would know about a problem arising, and they would they would work that out before it ever happened. You know, I fully understand that you're Canadian and not American, but I'll talk to both of us yeah. <laughs> because my mother was from Canada, and I understand both both countries fairly well. It's the people who have given up the responsibility. You don't have a pyramid like a federal government without having the bottom be strong, the pyramid won't stand up. The people don't know these things. And years ago, Thomas Jefferson said that the most important thing that a country can have is a strong media. Because if the people don't know the true facts of what's going on, they don't vote that way. And one of the great problems we have in this country today is that the base level government structure, the wards, the precincts, the counties, the towns, the villages, the bottom of the pyramid almost does not exist. When I was a boy, I can remember a man knocking at the door, a real friendly person, and we, we all knew him, Tom Kelly. He was a representative of the nearest ward of the Democrats, and he was here to bring us to go to a lunch, and they were having a party somewhere. And we kept close together in these little units of local government, and we didn't let anything happen in the local government and then we elected people to the next level who didn't let anything happen that level. Finally, we let up the congressmen and senators and so on. As you know, that lower level has deteriorated for lack of legitimate information. How many of them could answer some of the questions that you and I have talked about, which are just perfectly normal questions? They're not esoteric things. They don't hear that kind of thing anymore. They don't read it in the papers. They don't read it in the magazines. They'll never hear anything like this on the TV. In fact, TV people, as I've said earlier, are the ones who came out against Oliver Stone's movie saying that things were in the movie were not true when they absolutely were true. Now, that's not the role of, the role of newspapers. However, the owners of newspapers, the owners, not the editor and the publisher and all that stuff, yeah. but the owner of the newspaper demand that things like that be written. So there's a serious problem right there. And if the people don't know these things, and they don't know these things naturally, it's much more fun to find out that a guy like... Ali North is stealing a few million dollars than it is to find out that uh, somebody did a great thing and brought some new educational process into 
Harvard University and so on and so on. You don't ever read anything like that, see? The good things are ignored and the terrible things. Every day you read, what is it, murders, accidents, air crashes, or, so on. Yeah, or OJ. You know, you know. It's just absolutely uh, ridiculous. And so you have to put those things together because we know what the substance of government ought to be, but we don't realize that in the federal organization, which I say is like a pyramid because the numbers get smaller at the top, at the bottom there's nothing anymore. There's no strength there. And it has taken place, the, the bottom, the discussions and everything in the local areas by very poor broadcasting on radio and TV and very poor radio, I mean, newspaper reporting. And so the people have no alternative. They don't know these things. Just the simple things we've talked about here. Yeah. They, they wouldn't know who the hell Alan Pope was and the Indonesian rebellion in 58. I, I'll bet you one in a million people wouldn't know what we were talking about. That's the situation. And it's really that bad. But yeah, and to make matters worse, that um, you know, you have the people who have given up on the big government and they form their own little government sure. communes that call sure. them militias. They're trying again to rebuild. But in the same token, I think a lot of them have got misinformation where they're, they're, they're taking it a step too far. They're almost paranoid, you know. They've given up any hope for any kind of change. Therefore, yeah. they're like the free men. They're, nothing else exists and we have our own law and we mm -hmm. don't recognize your, your court system and, uh, and uh, the whole troubles that they're starting well. with that. So Things that's not the right that way, way to go either. We didn't start with 48, we didn't start with 50 states. Yeah. We started with a certain number of 100,000 people. Yeah. And then they gradually made counties and villages and towns. I've read in places that the ideal government of humankind is a village of about 1,500 people. But we won't talk about that. The one thing that is, that is very important these days is take the drug problem. Now, drugs come in in aircraft or some of them in ships, but I'd say 90% of the drugs come into this country by aircraft. Now, we spend billions of dollars to have an impregnable air defense system. I was one of the founders. Five officers were sent to Colorado Springs in 1950 to organize the Air Defense Command. So I know exactly what its business is and how it works. And in those days, as you would call our early days, we were intercepting by radar an average of 47,000 flights a day over the United States. No matter which way they were coming, we intercept them. We had special radars for special conditions. Then out here in Norfolk, we had the Atlantic Sea Frontier, and the Navy knew all the ships at sea. In fact, they knew all the ships at sea all over the world now that they got the satellites up there. So we know every time you fill a rowboat with heroin or when you fill an airplane with coke or whatever's coming in, we know it's in the air. When I was running clandestine operations, like a flight from the coast of Florida into Cuba, bringing some uh, people in to do one thing or another against Castro, I would have to call first Air Defense Command, and I'd say, this little plane, six passenger small plane, is coming in tonight at about 9.30, and you will see it on your radar, leave it alone and it'll be there about two hours. It'll be coming out around 11.30. You'll see that. Leave it alone. Well, I had some cleared officers in the Air Defense Command. They put that on the records, and they wouldn't touch the airplane. Well, suppose they were delivering drugs instead of doing something the government had set up for them to do. You see, the, the drug guy could call them and say, look, I've got a plane coming in tonight with 10 tons of drugs. Don't touch that airplane. Well, that's collusion. See, he's in on it. But why is it? that the, this great defense system that we have that can see every single airplane in the air, in fact, we can see flocks of crows in the air with the thing, is perfect, can't see planes going to Mena, Arkansas, loaded with drugs. Now, that's utterly ridiculous, and that means that somewhere there's collusion through the government to the powers that be that run the drug program, which may be the same people when you think about it, you see? And I know that from flying planes myself in the transport business from being with the Air Defense Command when it was started and from running clandestine operations later in my career from the Pentagon. And you, the, the sky is absolutely covered with this stuff and you cannot get through night or day, rain or snow, and yet coming through every single day. That just proves collusion in the drug business. Why don't we stop the drug business? You see, there are the, those are the elemental facts of life.
Texas. How many people know that we could stop every plane going to Mena, Arkansas, no matter whether it's going treetop height or whether it's a satellite going by and dropping it down? And, you know, we used to drop items from satellites by letting them go up there at uh, 15 miles up and just let the thing drop. And when we hit the ground, we'd pick it up. We, we were able to track it, things like that. From a satellite, it would drop here? From a satellite, sure. And we'd pick it up. We'd pick it up in the ocean. A fellow that used to be uh, one of my operations officers in my Tokyo squadron had that job out there. He'd be out flying around the ocean because he couldn't tell which wave it was going to be in, but they'd say the satellite will release this thing and it'll come down within such and such an area. And of course, it'd have a parachute on it, and they'd see it coming down, go pick it up. Oh, I see. So it'd be like a roll of film or something. Yeah, yeah. But if they can do that, my God, they can find a little boat with, with drugs on it, see. It's just that, that they're turning it around the other way. They're letting the government assist them and bring it in instead of the other way around. They used to use my planes in Southeast Asia bringing drugs directly in from China. They'd go up into South China. And if they ever got caught, there'd be a box like a coffin. I mean, it, not that it was coffin shaped, but it was a real coffin. They said, oh, we're bringing in a friend of ours over here. His grandmother died, and we're just bringing her down a barrier there. Her son lives down in in uh, Laos, and we <laughs> open up the box with full of drugs. We used to see when we had the army in Burma, we, we used to pay the army. We paid the British army with British money. We paid the American army with American money. We paid the Chinese army with packages of heroin. That's the traditional pay for the Chinese army. So our army, to pay them, had heroin.